Hi, my name is Michael Chikin. The smartest people I've met have one common belief, that us silly humans really don't know much. For example, we still don't know why planes stay in the air, or how Tylenol or even gravity works. Yeah, gravity. Look it up. <laughs> in today's distracted, clickbait, misinformation age, I wish we could all be less certain, more humble, and a lot more curious. Admittedly, I've been known to struggle with all three. So no more, no less, this show is my attempt to be that change. Thanks for joining me, and here we go. Hi everyone, welcome back to No More, No Less. I'm still your host, Michael Chikin. And today in the studio, I have with me Nessa Carey. Um, Nessa is a PhD in virology. She did her postdoctorate in human genetics and then lectured on molecular biology. She has written three fascinating books, which is how I found out about her. One is Hacking the Code of Life, uh, The Epigenetics Revolution, and Junk DNA. So I'm very pumped to get to chat about all things genetics today. Uh, so let's dive in. Nessa Carey, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Michael. Lovely to see you. Uh, as I was looking over the breadth of your career in, in science, um, I've seen you've done so many different things. But let's start with uh, the, you know, the big one, epigenetics. And a quote that I found in some of my research, the big one was, epigenetics can potentially revolutionize our understanding of the structure and behavior of biological life on Earth. Now, that's, that's a pretty grandiose claim for, 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 for one thing. So I was hoping that you could like, explain to us laymen like, like exactly what epigenetic, epigenetics is and how it may help us silly little humans moving forward. Sure. We've always had a bit of a puzzle going on, which is that we all love the genetic code. We all love DNA. And we pretended for a while as if DNA was the answer to everything. And DNA is incredibly important, our genetic sequence. But we've actually known for a really long time that there must be other factors at work as well, because we know of lots of situations where two things are genetically identical. And yet the two things are phenotypically different. They don't look the same or they don't act the same. So to give you a couple of examples, um, you can keep genetically identical mice in environmentally completely the same conditions, and yet the mice won't be the same as each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or if you look at your body, you've got about 70 trillion cells in your body, and almost all of them have exactly the same DNA content. But your eyeballs are very different from your kidneys. So they're using the same genetic code in a different way. So epigenetics was originally described as an expression to explain that situation where things are genetically the same, but they turn out differently. What we now understand, and this is what makes epigenetics exciting, is we understand some of how that happens. We understand that it's because of modifications to DNA and the proteins it's wrapped around. And these modifications change gene expression. They don't change what the gene codes for but they can act like an on-off switch, and they can also act as a volume switch for how highly expressed a gene is. And so we're now at this stage where we have a molecular link between basically nature and nurture. So it's pretty cool. Right. Yeah, it is pretty cool. The, I, the first thing that comes to mind is how you said there's, if there's two people that are, that are twins raised together, or, or mice, as you mentioned. Um, now, would the epigenetics be laying on top of the DNA and only, and only begin to encode after birth? Or are, people, are humans born with different epigenetics from the get-go? So humans are born with their own epigenetic modifications from the get-go. But initially, they're very much driven by genetics and the environment in the womb. So if you look at identical twins when they're born and you look at their epigenetic modifications, they're very, very similar. The older the twins get, the less similar those epigenetic modifications become. So they start diverging. Their genetics stays exactly the same, but their epigenetics starts to shift. But we are all born with particular epigenetic modifications on our genes. And those okay. seem to be very highly influenced by things that happen in the first trimester of pregnancy. Those kind of set mm -hmm. certain types of epigenetic modifications, essentially for the rest of our lives. Interesting. And have... have... And has any research been done on what exactly it is? Like, is it a nutrition um, protocol? Is it perhaps if there's any sort of trauma that's being, you know, experienced by the parent? Uh, 
Mozart or Robbie Williams <laughs> in the in the womb? Like, what's uh... <laughs> yeah? Um, if you listen to Mozart, listen to Mozart because you like Mozart, not because you think it's going to make your baby smarter. Right. I remember that um, was an article that came out years and years ago, and I'm sure there's so many classical music haters that were just like, well. Baby's going to be smart. Baby's going to be smart. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, yeah, I suspect the baby just came out going, God, turn the volume down on this bloody music. Right. Right. Um, it's certainly things like nutrition, we think, have a big impact. Um, now, it's possible that stress for the mother may also have a big impact simply because that will lead to her having more stress hormones circulating in her blood. And a percentage of those can cross the placenta. And so they may affect what's happening in the baby. It's not the same thing as saying she's psychologically stressed and it has some magic effect right. on the stress levels of, of the baby. We do know that many conditions, particularly chronic conditions, are really affected by the first three months in utero. So that's why it's so important for women to have access to good nutrition, to have good access to healthcare, um, ideally not to be smoking or drinking alcohol in excess. What we never had before was an understanding of why that mattered. Why yeah. would something that happens for the first you know, um, 12 weeks of embryonic life, why could that affect you for the rest of your life? Now we understand that it's almost certainly because right. epigenetic modifications are being established, which influence how you do things like metabolize food for the rest of your life. That's really interesting. That, that reminds me of a conversation I had years ago with a, a wife of a friend, and she was a be a fetal alcohol nurse or something like, I, I, I yeah. can't remember the exact uh, title, but so, but she was telling me that it's not, sometimes it's not even people that are alcoholics per se. It's let's say people in their twenties or thirties that are maybe going out and, and, and partying and they happen to have a, a bout of three months of a lot of drinking and the mother doesn't know that she's pregnant. Yeah, And absolutely. so, and it's, it's really interesting that we, we often think that there's only the extremes that are dangerous for us yeah. where we think like, okay, well, if you drink too much alcohol while you're pregnant, well, then your child's going to have fetal alcohol syndrome or all these other problems, et cetera. But we it seems we forget to consider that even like a minimum dose is going to have a net negative impact over not having a glass of wine or not, you know, having too much of any sort of substance. So, so are they still trying to figure out like, yeah. you know, like um, that? They are still trying. We, as you know, the scientific community, is still trying to figure that out. And there are possibly certain substances where there is no such thing as a safe level. Um, right. Radiation and cigarette smoke, for example. You know, there's no point at which you go, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Just a little <laughs> bit of a radiation, sure. or just the occasional cigarette. Um, Alcohol is a complex one um, mm -hmm. because, as you say, women often don't know that they're pregnant. And I'm very wary of creating the impression that um, women spend their entire lives only waiting to be pregnant. And then when they're pregnant, we basically hammer the life out of them for everything we say they've done wrong for their right. baby. You know, we have to be really careful to avoid that. The problem is that, as you say, it might just be that you're really unlucky that you hmm. have, I don't know, a month where you're feeling rubbish or where everybody has a birthday party and you're out drinking more than is sensible in, ter in health terms. And that happens to coincide with a critical developmental window for your fetus. Right. Um, but to be honest, you can kind of get around that by the idea of, well, keep drinking within normal levels generally, you know, just take into advice into account the health advice. However, I have to say that as somebody who's 59, I'm much better at doing that now than I was when I was 25. Right. Yeah. I think, I think you know? we all were. Yeah. I think Absolutely. we all were. Yeah. Absolutely. Like how many times I look back and talking with some friends were like, that wasn't necessary. That was Absolutely. unnecessary. That was <laughs> some, not necessary. Some of those, those evenings, but so I, I'm not sure if you're aware of, there's a podcast called uh, the Andrew Huberman lab uh, no, podcast. I don't know that one. And uh, I believe he's a neuro neurobiologist, uh, I'm going to get it wrong, but he's a scientist and runs a lab in Stanford. And mm -hmm. what he, he's been really beating the drum quite heavily on uh, alcohol minimum dose on Twitter and otherwise, saying that it really seems that a healthy level is one to two drinks per week. And that even anything above that, he goes, but even less than that is better. Um, uh -huh. And so it's an interesting conversation because we're thinking like we've taken for granted that it's big, alcohol is really intertwined into the fabric of our life, nowhere more present than the UK, for, yeah. for, for, for example. And 
it's really interesting because it, it ima you imagine how many other things impact uh, a fetus's development and even after the the baby's born and if it's like stress in the stress in the home environment if it's really you know nutrient uh lacking foods yeah. it, it really can impact the de developmental health of just the brain trying to trying to grow and become you know yeah. everything that it potentially could could be so after when we're growing up are they being able to establish what has more impact on the epigenetics moving forward or is that still a bit of a black box? It's still a bit of a black box and one of the things you have to bear in mind is that humans are a terrible experimental species oh, because we're definitely. genetically very outbred, we have um, big environmental variation, um, people are not desperately keen on offering you bits of their brain for study while they're still alive, you know, I've heard so that. we're, we're I've a heard terrible that. species. Right. <laughs> yep. um, so you do have to be careful because some studies are based on extrapolation from rodents, which are the closest thing we can get, okay. or at least the closest thing we can use convincingly. So you have to be very careful about extrapolating. Then the other problem that we have is actually most of the good data on, <coughs> excuse me, that's actually on humans is epidemiological data, where you, know, you can Service. study the alcohol intake and you can see what the long-term consequences are for offspring, for example. The trouble is that's a very long way from showing that those consequences are due to epigenetic changes. The epigenetic changes right. are a very good hypothesis, but I'd be a bit rash if I said it can all be explained by epigenetics. So okay. we have this mechanistic gap. We can make extrapolations and they can be quite reasonable extrapolations or they can be absolutely back crap crazy extrapolations. You know, we can do either. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> and the problem is that it's very difficult to unravel all of that. So to be honest, as an individual, what I always revert to is the epidemiological information, which is, you know, if epidemiology tells me it is very unhealthy to have the kind of levels of alcohol consumption that are typical in the UK, for example, because we have a big dysfunctional relationship with alcohol as right. a population. Um, I follow the epidemiology that says this is a very bad idea to drink that much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and I worry about the mechanism later. So I, I tend to go that way around. So we right. don't always understand the reasons why things are unhealthy. I can always come up with a great hypothesis for why it's epigenetics, but I could be completely wrong. That's one <laughs> of the problems with epigenetics. You can always come up with lovely hypotheses that you can't test. So what's the Right. Reason? Well, I guess that um, was like my, my a basic question. I was wondering if, if you'd even be able to, to walk me through, like how from the, uh, from the genesis of realizing that epigenetics is a, is a thing, how are they able to realize that, okay, we're seeing, like, is it just like a microscopic, observation where we're seeing something on top of, of DNA and we realize that these things are affecting genes? Like, I guess these, this is all mouse rodent data. Um, some of it. Um, so we have actually one of the best systems for looking at epigenetics is yeast. So a lot of work is done in yeast, but it can also be done in rodents. Um, it can be done in pretty much any animal, if you like. Um, the difficulty is then understanding how much you're looking at genetic variation, how much you're looking at epigenetic variation. But there are some beautiful experiments, um, particularly, actually, there's a really lovely one with alcohol, if I can digress into alcohol for a minute sure. again, um, which is there's a particular type of mouse called the agouti viable yellow mouse. And <laughs> some mice in a litter with this will be skinny and brown and some will be fat and golden. And they're very, very cute. And they're all genetically the same. The difference between their phenotype is just due to their epigenetics. It's a particular region of their genome which has different epigenetics. Work from a great scientist in Australia called Emma Whitelaw shows that if you give a female mouse alcohol and then she has babies, that the ratio of skinny brown babies to fat yellow babies changes. And so that's showing you that alcohol intake in the mother is affecting the epigenetics of the next generation because mm. the link between the appearance of these mice and their epigenetics is pretty much one to one. So it's a beautiful example of where you can show that an environmental stimulus has a major epigenetic effect, if that makes sense. And is wow, sure. It, it opens up a whole bunch of different questions, like along the lines of even if we talk about the obesity epidemic. And yeah. I, I don't I don't and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we fully even understand the the impact of what the mother does ingests 
uh, you know, the impact on, on the baby. So let, let's say for, um, you know, for the purpose of this discussion, let, let's say what the mother is completely eating or desiring um, gets translated onto the, on the child. And at that point, maybe if she's eating maybe a lot of fast food or a lot of, you know, a lot of these things that maybe that could make a child predisposed to having a palate that, you know, maybe hits the reward center of the brain for salt, fat, and, and sugar more than someone that is eating a lot of vegetables and all of these things. Like, is, is that a reasonable yeah, it is a, it's a reasonable hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that you can test to some degree in rodents. You can test taste preferences. Um, right. And we do know that if, for example, a mother is very obese during pregnancy, that that has long-term consequences for her offspring, for her children. And epigenetics is giving us very good it's giving us very interesting ways of exploring that and understanding again why these very early experiences even in utero can infect you for the rest of your life hmm. i think the thing though that we need to remember is i'm i i absolutely adore science i'm wearing a jumper that says geek for heaven's sake oh, i you love know, that I, 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 I couldn't see the full word yeah, that's there great. you go geek um, that's great yeah, I love science, but I think we also have to be very, very careful not to think we can science our way into and out of every problem. Right. So poor maternal nutrition has a very major effect on offspring and their health. In some ways, you could argue, do we really care why? We know, hmm. we know that it has this effect and we know it's almost always due to poverty. Um, yeah, the biggest thing that is going to affect a child in their life is if they come from a poor family. We don't need to understand the epigenetics to start addressing that. Right. You know, we don't need to know every single metabolic step that leads to those poor outcomes. You could argue it would be much, much cheaper just to tackle poverty. Um, so it's, to me, I'm in this sort of double-edged position where I think it's scientifically very interesting and sociologically almost irrelevant because we okay. know what to do to have a healthy population. We just don't do it. Right, well, yeah, I, that seems to be the, the truth in many cases this, uh, yeah. in, in, in this age. Whereas, yeah, because I guess you could say like, if we realize that poverty itself is causing so much damage to, you know, um, memory and cognitive function, uh, forward planning, th things like that, then we could say, okay, what are all the things that um, poverty creates? And if it's that, if that's stress, if it's that, that like there's things, at least in Western societies that like, as you said, we can, we could solve the majority of yeah. these things. Um, but I don't think many people have the will to want to be either a little bit inconvenienced or to work uh, together because there is a bit of an epidemic of individual individualism that seems to be yeah. uh, thriving for better, or for, for worse right now. So yeah. I guess moving a little bit on from epigenetics, um, the, the CRISPR uh, program, that oh. uh, that was in the news. I think I read about it maybe ten years ago uh, in Scientific American, and I remember it blew my mind for all of the things that yeah. you really could do, all the all the potential for it. And one of the qu questions that I'm I'm wondering how much you know about uh, actually, or maybe you could explain CRISPR firstly for people that don't know what it is. Okay, so CRISPR is this awesome technique, also called gene editing, where scientists can basically change the DNA sequence of any organism that they fancy, um, you know, butterfly, rice, whatever you fancy, you can change it. You can change it with exquisite sensitivity and specificity, and you only have to change it once and the job is done. So it's like the, if you think of the old genetic modification and GM, that's sort of like hieroglyphs and gene editing is like the latest version of Microsoft Word. It's just an Correct. incredible way of actually changing the DNA of any organism. I believe really you're not able to change it back. Is that true? You could change it. The only way you change it back is by going in and doing gene editing again, re-crispering it. Okay. So, okay. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something. I, I read that if you're, if you're changing maybe a, a, a baby's uh, DNA or that you couldn't change it back, but maybe that's something more specific. You could, but it, the effect itself is irreversible. The only way to change it back would be to go in and use CRISPR again to reverse what you've done, which is nobody's idea of fun time when you're right. talking about humans. Right. Yeah, because the ethical implications seem to be quite widespread um, for what people can do for, let's say, um, the rich having the luxury to having a gene edited baby and they can have all the things that they would like. Uh, yeah. And then it creates 
you know, even even more conflict for people that are, let's say, in impoverished conditions or even the middle class that can't afford to, let's say, um, well, this would be a bit of an ethical dilemma. Let's say someone doesn't want to have uh, an autistic child or uh, a, a child with Down syndrome, and they want to make sure that they cannot. That's one question if they should be able to right away, because yeah. there'll be people in both communities that are saying like these, these are still humans. These are still people that we should let be born and, and, and mm-hmm. live in the world. And I'm sure you and I could have an hour uh, discussion just on Indeed. on something like that. W- one question I had about CRISPR was, do you think we'd be able to, like, like everyone thinks about, like, okay, we can all become superhuman, <laughs> which is clearly unlikely. But uh, would we, we be able to gene edit our way into different emotional predispositions or better energy levels, like things like that, if we can realize what volume need to be turned up and which maybe need to be turned off? Yeah, uh, very, very unlikely. Um, because most of those things, um, what they depend on is the interaction of large numbers of genes with different environmental stimuli. So CRISPR is great, it would appear, for things like um, curing sickle cell disease. Because in sickle cell disease, patients have one mutation in a gene, and that gives them sickle cell disease. But with stuff like metabolism, or emotional state, that's not governed by one gene. It's governed by loads of different genes. And then it's governed by loads of different genes and the epigenetic information that they carry with them. And it's governed by the environment and it's governed by random flux. So trying to go in and make all of those changes would be unbelievably difficult, even if we knew what to change. Right. So if if you're using like the light switch, you would just be doing this. Absolutely. It would be to, like to having see if the, get it right. Yeah, it'd be like having the biggest lighting board from a Broadway production. Right. But well, we both know that someone everything. is going to try to do that. Like there is going to be an evil scientist somewhere that starts recruiting people to say, okay, we're going to see if we can turn all your fast twitch mu- muscle fibers on. We're going to make you faster, stronger. Like there's a Captain America <laughs> mindset somewhere out there for sure that as soon as they saw CRISPR, at CRISPR they opened a lab. Yeah, I, I, it, it's quite possible. Um, I think where you would do it, you wouldn't, you'd probably try to do it more for things like um, sports that rely on muscle mass. So, you know, something like weightlifting or possibly even sprinting where it's all about you know, that muscle. Right. Um, you'd be more likely to do it there because um, those are easier. You just basically take, a, you know, you modulate the signal that tells your muscles to stop growing. Um, right. But again, there are there are actually easier ways of training good athletes rather than <laughs> trying to get this completely overmuscled person who might be overmuscled but might have no motivation whatsoever. Right. Yeah. So Is... um so yeah, it's I I don't worry so much about those consequences of CRISPR because I think they're they're right at the bottom of a slippery slope that we're nowhere near approaching at the moment. Right. And there, and I guess the, the, the big elephant in the room on, on CRISPR is how people might use it for aging, for example. Like there's David Sinclair, the author of Lifespan, who I've had that giant book on Kindle for too long. So uh-huh. I, need to, I need to read it quite soon. <laughs> but um, he, he's always, uh, you know, tweeting certain things on, on how aging is a disease and something that we can reverse. And I'm sure if we find the mechanisms at some point, we can use CRISPR. But again, it's going to go to the highest bidder. It, it's um, going to go to the highest bidder. Um, right. But also we need to think about how we think about aging. Um, particularly we need to distinguish between are we saying we just want to increase lifespan or are we saying what we want is to increase healthy lifespan? Because we're all going right. to die of something. We don't like that thought, but it is going to happen. All that happens is that you change the thing we die from and when. So if okay. we look at the industrialized world, most of the industrialized world, cancer rates are on the rise. And it's not because there are more carcinogens in the environment. It's simply because cancer is a consequence of aging. And we all age more now because we don't die from heart attacks. Huh. Um, so something's going to get us. You know, I hate to tell people this, but we are all going to die. It's a it's a shock ending. What a bummer, um, Nessa. I know. I know. A what bummer. a spoiler. What a right. spoiler. <laughs> so I have to say, I think there's a lot of hype in the aging and longevity field. Um, And personally, I think it would be massively unethical to keep extending longevity, but not to improve health. Um, It's, there's the great Benjamin Franklin quote of, I don't mind getting old, I mind getting old and fat. Right. And, you know, 
getting old, that's absolutely fine. Getting old with lousy life um, well, quality, I, I, that's right. I, I think most of the people like Sinclair, for example, from what I, I know about his work, would would agree with you. I think they would be working on, on both sides of that equation. Just like there's, you know, in, in actually in the US, I'm sure in the UK as well, there's all of these men's clinics and they're prescribing, you know, testosterone replacement therapy to literally everyone that comes in the door. Like, I, you know, I know people that were prescribed testosterone therapy at 31 years old. You're kidding. No, it's a, it's a, it's, it's absurd. And, yeah, uh, and, you know, and, and, you know, they had a justification for why they started taking it at that time. And, you know, I'm a, a, by no means, and I'm not a scientific person to say anything, but I know enough to know that we don't need testosterone at 31. Uh, and, and so it's become an, an, an industry, which is, which is, which is sad because again, once you start taking that, you have to take it for the rest of your yeah. life. And I don't know enough about it, but I'm sure I'm 43 now, maybe at 50, I would consider something along those lines, but I think the risks still, you know, might out, outweigh the rewards. And I think you used a really interesting expression. You referred to it as an industry and that's exactly what it is. It's an industry and it's an industry that thrives in societies that value youth and appearance above everything else. Um, and I think we really need to have a, a, a good chat with ourselves about what, what our attitudes to aging are um, and why we have them. Is it really about quality of life or is it about vanity? Because, um, sure, hmm. I'd love to have the energy levels and the body that I had at 20. However, <laughs> if you said, OK, you can have the, that, but you also have to have all the social anxiety, the shyness, the lack of self-confidence, et cetera. I'd be like, no, I'm fine with the decrepit carcass that I'm in at the moment, thanks, you know? <laughs> um, and I think we have to be, the fact that we change as we get older is not necessarily a sign that it's an illness. It's a sign that that's natural life progression. Now, one has to be very, I should never use the phrase natural because who knows, knows what natural means. You know, natural right. means dying in an epidemic when you're four. Natural means, you know, dying from a heart attack when you're 40. Um, All right. That's a nice, that's a nice disclaimer. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so I need to be careful about that, but I do, I do worry about this idea that somehow we can stay 25 until we're 85. I, it just also, again, it comes back to the health inequalities thing. Yeah. You know, right. That, that is not going to be available to everybody. And when you also bear in mind that population growth is driven not by increasing birth rates, but by decreasing rates of death. Right. There's also you, a really big ethical question there. You, you, about be, you, you, beat, me, you beat me to it. The, 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 the next thing I wanted to talk about was the, the elephant in the room that even when we talk about climate change, nobody ever talks about that overpopulation. Like we, like we are the biggest threat to the environment, the amount of like energy we consume, the amount of Especially. waste that, that we, that we create. So that seems to be part of the, the equation when you're thinking about gene editing and longevity and all of these things like this, I think I, I saw a, a stat the other day where if everyone on the planet consumed as much as the average American, we would need five planets. Absolutely. And people are saying, and we definitely do need to go to renewables and start pulling, you know, stop pulling um, oil out of the ground. However, we still need to pull out, you know, lithium for, for batteries. We need to pull out like all these other things for our phones and our plastic nonsense yeah. that we, we've created here. And Absolutely. It, it, there's very few people that are even talking about these things that if you can now edit genes, then, okay, maybe if you, instead of having two kids, maybe you'll want to have five or like, and no one wants any restrictions on their, on their life. Like, I think, exactly. I think we can agree when China did the one child policy, it was a bit drastic in the way that policed it was also drastic. But if we end up in a position where there's 15 billion of us or something on the planet, like at, at what point do you not say like, listen, rabbits, stop <laughs> doing this. Exactly. Uh, it's, um, it's a really interesting one because it's, it's to do the rise in populations is to do with declining death rates. It's not due to increasing birth rates. And we also have to take right. into account that it is not um, simply about numbers, it's about consumption by those numbers. So a child born in Bangladesh will have one twelfth of the carbon footprint of a child born in America. So you could have 12 kids in Bangladesh. Well, you could have 11 kids in Bangladesh and still not have the impact of one American child. Wow. Um, I'm sure Europe is pretty much the same sort of numbers as the US. Probably similar. Yeah. So it's about consumption. 
Um, it's not just about simple numbers. And it's really interesting how that birth control thing, it's always people over there must stop having so many children. You know, we right. never go, people over here must stop living so long. You know, right. absolutely not. It's always people over there, usually people from different races, <laughs> usually non-white people. It's, it's all them causing the problem. And it isn't. It is us. It is the privileged North. Um, and when people say to me, oh, I've only had two kids, it's like, A, you don't get a medal. <laughs> B, right. those kids are still going to have a huge environmental impact. Right. You know, and we, we frame the debate all wrong. We're not addressing the real problems in it. And the real problem, of course, is you cannot have limited growth and uh, limitless growth on a finite planet. Right. And we have well, to get so much better at not overconsuming. We have to get so much better at circular economies. Well, the, the, this, the sad part is that the argument coming out um, on, I guess the, you can call them climate deniers, and, and I'm sure much of this is coming from uh, religious circles, um, of which I never agree with at all. Um, yeah. But a lot, it's along the lines of saying that, like, well, if we humans are this vaulted being, because, of course, their God is a human mm -hmm. man uh, in, 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 in many religions. And and they're saying, well, if we have more humans, then we have more brain power. And if we have more brain power, we can create all the solutions. And it kind of makes me furious when I hear that that suggestion yeah. that humans are all knowing beings, uh, mm -hmm. because in, in, in my mind, like trees, for example, are, are they're on a different timeline. They're on like hundreds of years timeline. They're just waiting for the pests that are the is the human race to to, to, to to go away finally. And so if we think of that like humans are the answer, like we're already looking at the at the wrong thing and ignoring the rest of yeah, the universe, the, the planet, nature, all, all, all of these things. And yeah, it, it frustrates frustrates me to no end totally, the overpopulation. Totally. Um we are the problem. We are not the solution. We right what we have a responsibility to do now, I think both ethically and pragmatically, is to stop being so big a problem um, in the sense that we need to travel much more lightly on the planet. We need to be much more aware of what we're doing. And again, to me, we need to stop sciencing our way out of this. Um, science will have a role to play and things like carbon capture, fantastic mm -hmm. potential. But right now, if you simply insulated all the houses in North America and all the houses in Europe properly, you'd have an amazing impact on our requirement for fuel. Um, and that doesn't require science. That just requires a tiny bit of money and a bit of political thought behind right. it. Um, but instead, we just go carbon capture, nuclear fusion. It's, <laughs> and it, it's, it's infuriating. Yeah. Absolutely infuriating. I, I, can, I can definitely get caught up in that. Like, I'll, I'll watch a 20-minute YouTube video on nuclear fusion and, like, the... Um... Uh, the ITER project in, uh -huh. uh, in, in in France and all these yep. like really amazing discoveries that they're having in this area of nuclear fusion that it seems like, you know, well, they say next it's always 30 years away, but it, it really seems like now in the, in the next 10 or 15 years that they might get somewhere with this. But yep. like, again, it also scares me that if we have this abundant, unlimited energy, we will waste it as sure as we wasted so many other gifts that, oh, that, we've, that, that we've had. So Absolutely. it's... So yeah, it's anyhow we're we're, we're getting uh, we're getting pulled into the uh, <laughs> an, an, another area. But um, I was reading your um, a Huff Post article um, as well on uh, on epigenetics, and there was a study in rats found that uh, sons of cocaine using father rats were resistant to the allure of cocaine. So you ended that article saying that science still had much to learn about how transgenerational epigenetics affects people. And so I'm wondering, because I believe that was written several years ago. Yeah. Um, are we closer to understanding this since the article, you know, since that was, was um, written? Because we're a little bit closer. I would like to point out as well, how much fun scientists have sometimes, like what, a, what inspired somebody <laughs> start giving rats alcohol or cocaine? I mean, you know, seriously, imagine going right. home and describing your working day. How was your um, day, dear? Well, oh. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I found a brick of meth and I was giving it to a squirrel. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, it's yeah. fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, this is why people go into science. Um, we're starting to get a better handle on how certain things get passed down. Um, and again, mo almost all the reliable data are from non-human species. Okay. And epigenetic plays a role in that, but we have to be very careful. It's not necessarily direct inheritance of epigenetic modifications. It probably has more to do with inheritance of... Um, what are called small non-coding RNAs, so little bits of message 
um, that little bits of information encoded in RNA that get passed on from parent to child. Okay. Um, and they probably then set up a new pattern of epigenetic modifications. So I think the data are really strong now in loads and loads of species that under the right experimental conditions, you can get this transfer of non-genetic information from parent to child. Hmm. Um, where it's really, really difficult to demonstrate is in humans. Again, for exactly the same reasons that we talked about earlier, that we're too genetically diverse, we're too environmentally diverse. So occasionally you do see effects in humans at a population level. But using that to say this is happening in this family or it happened to this individual, I think that will be pretty much impossible ever to show. Doesn't mean it right. doesn't happen, because I would like to argue that if it's happening in all these other species, including other mammalian species, why would we argue that there is something magical about humans that means it never happens to us? But being able to show that it happens to an individual is a very different proposition. Well, because I guess there's always, you know, some sort of ratio between nature and, and nurture and all of these things. And I wonder if, let's say you're talking about a, a drug addicted parent, and then if the child is going to be uh, susceptible to things like that, I can imagine how that would be very difficult to study yeah. and quantify because alcohol specifically, because if a child's growing up in that environment, it's exactly. kind of like almost literally monkey see monkey do. Yeah. So you can't, you can't really say like, uh, unless the, the alcoholic was the father and the father is absent uh, after the, uh, you know, after the birth of the child. And then perhaps you can get like some isolated, you know, non relevant, not relevant sample sizes of, uh, of, of data. Exactly. But it's, like you said, it, it seems to be a, a, impossible and you just have to kind of guess with the information available. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, it's, you would have to do the most extraordinary large scale and highly unethical experiments of basically taking newborn infants away from their birth environment and putting them into completely different environments. And even then, I bet you all we would be able to see would be at most a population scale effect because right. there's just too much going on in our lives, um, which is kind of encouraging because it means that actually you're not very often we're not predetermined or we're not predestined genetically or epigenetically in terms of how our life is going to turn out. Um, that it has much more to do with the environment that we're living in at any particular time and the, all the things that affect that environment. And that's kind of good because good it's easier to change those things than it is to go in and go, oh, I wonder if we can muck about with this person's epigenetic profile. Right. Yeah, th th there, there are so many things that kind of would remove the ability to objectively tell if yeah. genetics are, uh, you know, a, 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 um, you know, a big, a big changer of, of behavior over time. And we have, yeah. And we have to be really careful as well, because we have a tendency to go, oh, there's a difference between those two groups must be due to genetics. Let's look for the genetic signatures. Right. Um, and that's not what's happening at all. So if we look in the UK, for example, um, people of color, were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Um, and it would have been very tempting to go, let's look for the genetic signatures. But actually it was to do with poverty and social class. It wasn't to do with genetics. And a very similar thing if you look at sudden infant death syndrome. Um, so it was recognized a while back that the rates of sudden infant death were much lower in the UK in people who came from families that had originated in the Indian subcontinent than they were in white British families. And again, it would have been very tempting for experimenters to go, oh, there must be big genetic differences underlying cot death. What it turned out to be was whether or not you put your baby down on their front or on their back when you put them to sleep. And that was a cultural thing. Um, and so we have to be incredibly careful when we look at anything in humans not to go, I've got a genetic analysis tool, therefore I will analyze everything genetically. We need right. to have a much wider way of looking at questions than that, because it's really easy to get carried away by genetics, especially these days when it's so cheap to do sequencing. Right. And if you're if someone, like you said, that really depends on science to have all the answers, then maybe you'll dismiss a lot of the environmental factors that of, of which we have 
billions and trillions of, of combinations. Absolutely. Like if, if you're looking, let's say even at a, a child that's eight years old and you don't know that, the, let's say that they were molested or have some sort of, sort of real trauma in yeah. their, in their life. Well, that's obviously going to affect their, their behavior and how they view the world and totally. how they interact with the world. But if you're assuming like, Oh, this must be because their mother ate too much cheesecake when she was pregnant. Well, then, like, <laughs> exactly. you're kind of just you're, you're you're you think you're playing God to be able to predict all of these things. Whereas, I think it's the kind of the infallibility of our species in which we just can't know everything, and we we try as we we might, but we'll always come up a little short. I'm Absolutely. sure. Absolutely, I I love the statement. I can't remember who made it first that the human brain is the most complex one and a half kilos of matter in the entire universe. Um, and trying to think that we can run simple tests on that right. and we will come up with really easy explanations, um, I, I just think is completely fallacious. You know, right. I, I don't, you know, I do love bringing a scientific approach to questions, but we also have to have a little bit of humility and think about the complexity of the questions that we're asking and whether or not right. something so complex as human emotion or human trauma can really be at this stage analyzed by running some relatively crude tests and going, oh yeah, that's why. It right. seems unlikely to me. Right. Well, in, in general, I think we saw that play out in a population level experiment during COVID-19, whereas everyone was trying to find out what is this virus? What does it do to us? How is it evolving? What will it be? And it, it actually was for as nightmarish as the, as the last couple of years have been, it was very interesting to see, you know, even people, let's say that are cardiologists thinking that they're now uh, virologists and immunologists and they're giving their, in their view, but they'll also get taken by all of these conspiracy theories and all of these yeah. things. And, you know, it has been really interesting to see how little hubris some people have yeah, to say, absolutely. to say that this is an, an evolving body of evidence. And, and who knows, who knows in five years if we'll see, okay, Maybe these mRNA vaccines, maybe there's something we do need to improve on them, for, yeah. for example. But we're kind of just acting on the best information we have so far. And so far, it's the most safety tested uh, drug that has ever existed in, in humanity. And for people to kind of dismiss that, again, it's really interesting that, uh, you know, the, kind of the, how the human mind might, might work. It is. It's fascinating. Um, and it's I find things like... Um... You know, the response to the pandemic, it, it's been really interesting in that people have gone, quick, we need an answer from science. And then they've said, oh, no, but we need an answer from science that is absolutely ironclad and 100 percent and totally safe. And how will right. I know this vaccine's safe? It's like, doesn't exist. How do you think stuff gets tested? How you know, we yeah. just, you know, we always have to. There is always some element of uncertainty that that's inevitable. That's part of life. Um, it's no different from, you know, you cross cross the road and you hope that a ruddy great lorry is not coming down rather faster right. than you had anticipated. Or there's even like, what is the example that some people will give for why the vaccines are bad? It's like, oh, well, um, remember the time where they were giving all these vaccines to people in polio for polio and they gave them polio. And like, yeah, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Like, like, Absolutely. That, like that was part of the progression. And yeah where I try to find common ground with people that are having this, that sort of debate is that like, yeah, I understand that there still should be some skepticism, but I think we have enough skepticism in the system now that, yeah. that at least we're taking it to a point where like, we understand there are risks. There are going to be people that unfortunately have consequences and yeah. we kind of, kind of accept these risks and it's, it, it really is unfortunate, but like we aren't, we are not godlike beings. We no. have to do the best with what we with what we have. Absolutely. And it comes back to whole risk benefit as well, you know, that, of right. weighing up that. And as humans, we're really poor at that. And we panic about tiny new risks simply because we've got used to the old big risks. So we don't right. see them as risks anymore. Um, but I think also there's still that lack of listening to people. Um, <laughs> you know, there are people who have been telling us for you know, two years that they are still suffering the consequences of COVID, that, you know, long COVID in particular. And you know, they possibly haven't been as well served by the medical and scientific community as they should have been, I simply agree. because we have a terrible tendency to go, yeah, we've no idea how that could have happened. So it hasn't. Instead of listening to a patient who's saying, I was absolutely fine. I was running half marathons. Then right. I had COVID and now I can't get out of bed. You know, we're, we, we have to start listening more as a community to what people are telling us. And I think that's right. really important for the scientific and the medical profession. But um, 
but it has to be within reason. You know, so somebody saying, oh, I don't like a vaccine because I think it's got microchips in it. You right. know, I, I don't feel a huge inclination to listen to that. I will try to be reasonable right. with someone yeah, about n- it. Not, but, a, yeah. not all voices should be weighed equally, but I think when there is like a number of people, like the people that are really suffering long COVID, um, I think there's enough data to say, and I think they are now, I think there are studies that are actually popping up and there's clinics that are dealing with it. Yeah, it, it's, t- I, it's I, taken longer than it should have done really though. Um, and right. I think certainly in science, we have a bit of a bad tendency to go, we don't know what that does, so it doesn't do anything. It's not important. Um, right. It might just be biology, actually. I think biology, we're particularly bad for that, that if we don't know what something does, we kind of go, well, it can't be important or we'd know about it, which is right. the most ridiculously fallacious reasoning. Actually, a little anecdote. Um, I, m- I met a, uh, a pain researcher who was a, an academic, a, pr- a professor at university in Canada. And uh, he told me a, a story once where he was dealing with one of his grad students and he said, okay, you need to go and figure out how, you know, X, Y drug works and do these things. And okay. And the, the student comes back maybe a week later and says, I was looking into how Tylenol works. And it appears that we don't currently know how Tylenol works in the scientific community. And the professor was completely dismissive. He's like, can you not do research? Like, why are you in grad school? And, 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 and he gave this kid such a hard time. And then he went and looked it up himself. And he's like, we don't know how no, Tylenol works. Tylenol works. <laughs> and, so, and so like this is an academic uh, professor and uh, and he realized like, wow, like there, there are a lot of things that we're still learning oh, and, or, and, or just insane. accepting that we don't know. Absolutely. Um, anesthetics. We have very little idea how anesthetics work. We'll occasionally describe, you know, they oh pass across the membrane, blah, blah, blah. We actually have very little understanding of why they work. We just know that they do. And actually an awful lot of medicine has proceeded because people found out that something worked and it can be decades before they realize it works for a completely different reason from the one they thought it did etc right but it just works um and it's whereas now if you said hey we've got this new painkiller we've no idea how it works you'd never get that past the regulators um and everybody would be like i'm not taking that you haven't got a clue what it's doing but pass me the tylenol Oh yeah, they're, they're, it's out on shelves right now. You can't even find a, a packet if you if you'd like. Yeah, that's really funny. Um, I, I want to touch on junk DNA for uh-huh. for a moment. I want to be respectful of your time. So, in, in in your book, one of the main things that I that I found incredible was that you found that ninety eight percent of our genome at one point was considered junk DNA. Like how yeah. we were just talking about how people are dismissed and how so much information is dismissed. I think there's no better. Um, no, no better uh let me see no but no better evidence here that how we do this almost pathologically so i mean it sounds crazy that the scientific community for so long was saying that this thing that we don't understand we're yeah. just going to consider that it, it it doesn't really have any function but this two percent that we do understand we give it so much gravity so mm-hmm. may, maybe you can take us through what the two percent was that we understood at that time and now what do we understand that this 98 percent of you know genetic dark matter is i suppose absolutely so in our bodies we've got things like insulin that signals whether or not our sugar levels are too high we've got things like hemoglobin that carries oxygen around in our blood um lots of things like that and they're all proteins um and they carry out tasks within our cells and within our bodies and we're very used to the idea that proteins are really important But one of the things that became really quite surprising was discovering how little of our DNA actually codes for proteins. It's 2%. Hmm. Um, But because we knew that proteins were important, we focused on that 2%. And we said the other 98% doesn't do anything. It's just junk. It's just there for no particular reason, which seems really unlikely. (laughs) Because that's an awful lot of DNA to have to reproduce every time a cell divides if 98% of it is meaningless or is just there as space and molecules. Um, And I think it was the classic thing of, we had ways of analyzing proteins, we knew about proteins. And so we thought, well, those are the important things. Instead of thinking, maybe the other stuff's important, but we just don't have a good way of looking at it. Hmm. And then there became examples of regions that didn't code for protein, but we knew were incredibly important. So for example, there's a particular region which is vital for half of human or half of mammalian life on this planet. And that's the bit that shuts off the X chromosome 
in females. So female mammals have two X chromosomes. So I've got two X chromosomes. You've got an X and a Y. Um, I always, I, every cell in my body has shut off one of my X chromosomes. And that completely relies on a bit of DNA that's not coding for proteins. Um, and yet we still went, yeah, but with the exception of that, all of that non-protein DNA is junk. We don't need it for anything. Oh. Um, and gradually we're realizing this isn't true. Some of it is just there as packaging, probably. Um, but a lot of it does play subtle roles in regulating how cells behave, in regulating how gene networks work together. Um, and we're starting to realize this is important. We're actually seeing companies now set up to exploit this and start finding new therapies. And I think it's just a really good example of how biologists in particular were very poorly trained in the philosophy of our discipline. So we make terrible mistakes of assuming that if we don't know what something does, it therefore does nothing. Um, and it's just, it's a great example of scientific hubris, basically. Um, and the trouble is it becomes dogma. So for the first people who started looking at the so-called junk DNA, they found it very difficult to get funding and very difficult to publish papers because the dogma was, well, what's the point? All of that stuff is rubbish. Um, and now wow. we have this thing um, really frustrating me when I published the book with people going, yeah, but it's not junk DNA. So why have you called it junk DNA? And why are you calling it junk DNA? Because it's not D junk DNA. It does something that's like, that's kind of the point of the book, that it was called junk DNA and that everyone said it didn't do anything. And now we know that it does. So we're in this. We do tie ourselves up with language quite a lot. Mm. And we do, as soon as we put stuff into categories, we then fight to maintain those categories for some reason, rather than going, hmm, maybe our categories are wrong. So right. it's really weird stuff. Academia seems to be, well, they, they do call it the, wa the walled garden for a reason, where they get quite <laughs> yeah. attached to these definitions of things. And it seems to have happened so many times over the past oh. hundred years or, or, even, or even longer since there has been academia, where something that's established, like you said, as dogma, and then the curiosity kind of stops there unless unless an outsider comes in and looks at it in a different way. And totally. you think that like at some level we would have said, okay, let, let's design a system in which we can out program our, our own biases to not want yeah. to be more curious so that we can say, there, okay, in this department, there should be someone that is always questioning these things and pulling out different experiments so we can test those hypotheses and move forward. Yeah. It's 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 unbelievable. Like we're such silly creatures. <laughs> we are such silly creatures. I think part of the problem is there isn't enough money to go around in the science budgets. Hmm. And so it's really hard for funders to go. Do you know what? There's absolutely no evidence about that, but it is kind of funky and strange. So let's put some money into it. It's much easier for them to go. Yeah, here's stuff we know is important, um, but it is really vital. Um, as a good example, actually, until about 70 years ago, it wasn't even accepted. Well, no, let's say 80 years ago, it wasn't even accepted that DNA was the genetic material. You know, certainly 100 years ago, people thought all the important information was in the proteins themselves. DNA wasn't that important. If no one had challenged that dogma, we wouldn't be where we are now in a world where we can correct sickle cell disease by using CRISPR. You know, it, it's it's right. really important to remember that today's taken for granted was somebody's revolution at some point. For for sure, I, I think even the mRNA vaccine has has quite good stories behind it. Yeah. For, for for one woman that was pushing it forward, and of course it's become a like a team effort that everyone's working on different on different parts of it. But it always takes one person that really believes to continue pushing, to find funding, and to continue to move to move the, the you know the line a little bit Absolutely. forward until uh, there's a, a enough groundswell. And the problem is, if you don't have that person and you don't have the funding, the technology isn't there when you need it. People don't right. always understand that, you know, something like COVID comes along and we can't suddenly go, hey, let's create a whole new vaccine. It, you know, that va those vaccines that came along so fast only existed because of 10, 20, 30 years of continuing research and funding. It's really important to keep our options open on these things. Well, and, and that seems to be the biggest thing that we lack right now for perspective is that we can't turn on the TV and look at part of the multiverse yeah. in a world in which these vaccines did not exist at yeah. all. Uh, and then we would have to go through like 
it, it really just would be a bit of the Hunger Games if you've ever read those those oh, yeah, those yeah. teen, yeah, those, those teen novels. Books. They're, they're yeah, wonderful. They're great. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the idea that like it's whoever would you know, who would not develop long COVID who'd be able to survive getting it three or four times. Yeah. Um, because even an article I read recently saying that like at one point we're going to be able to get to get affected nine ten times and you know some people will just be fine and at that point maybe we'll catch it like a common cold every every three years but on the way to that nth infection we have no idea who's going to be left behind with with long covid who's going to end up in the hospital and i think that's the part that i wish we could get some perspective that like there would be tens of millions more people that would be either disabled or dead if these vaccines didn't exist and It, it kind of it brings us back, you know, uh, humorously to the overpopulation. We're like, okay, so we've created this amazing technology, but like the planet's trying to get rid of us. <laughs> so like even even the most amazing scientific advancements forward is a net negative for the planet. Absolutely. So like I think this will break a lot of people's brains, mine mine included. I know it's and the the reality, of course, is stuff like COVID only emerges because of what we're doing to the planet. You know, it's absolutely if we were keeping ecosystems intact. Um, you wouldn't have this breakdown and these spillover events from the animal kingdom into the human kingdom, uh, human populations. Um, so, you know, we are very much reaping what we're sowing. Um, right. And it's you know, we have to break this cycle somewhere along the way. But I think the vaccines thing as well is really interesting because I think one of the reasons we have vaccine skepticism, um, apart from re- social media, et cetera, is because we have very few people in the West who remember the pre-vaccine days. Um, for, Great point. You know, for we've, we have forgotten how devastating infectious diseases are because mm-hmm. we have never had to live through pandemics before. You know, we don't come from a population who have seen their children dying from things like measles um, or devastation from the smallpox, et cetera. Because right. of vaccines and because of antibiotics, <clears throat> excuse me, we've become very complacent. We don't understand how dangerous these diseases are. And I think you know, we need to keep those memories alive in the same way that we talk about the importance of keeping memories of the Holocaust alive because it acts as a terrible warning. I think we need right. to keep those memories of pre-vaccine, pre-antibiotic days alive for exactly the same reason. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I guess the... The final question I, I have for you in, in your in your work, where do you think the future of genetics and, you know, epigenetics, DNA, CRISPR, like, is there anything that you're seeing now since you're you're in, in that world that is kind of going to be emerging or maybe some of the threats, just something to look into? I think there are real positives and I think the real positives are to do with things like um, treatment of human genetic diseases at much lower cost and with much better outcomes for patients. I think CRISPR is going to be an absolute game changer on that. I think we'll also see it building more robustness into our agricultural systems because we can actually create specific varieties of plant crops that will respond to particular um, stimuli or threats, but without breeding out all the other potentially useful bits in those crops. I think those are incredibly important. I think the immediate short term downsides of things like CRISPR is we will start seeing unethical um, practice in terms of poorly regulated areas where we'll see things like gene editing tourism, where prospective parents will be basically sold a lie about we can do these changes to your your offspring um, in while they're still tiny embryos and they will have a better chance of being clever or tall or whatever. You know, we will start seeing real um, snake oil applications of CRISPR or even just people claiming they're using CRISPR and they're not. They're basically just conning perspective parents. Right. I think that one's going to be very interesting to watch. I think the ones that are going to be potentially really scary with CRISPR and gene editing are if we start interfering at an ecosystem level by, say, introducing lethal mutations into insect populations that will spread through those insect populations. And we don't understand the ecological consequences of that. And also the fact you can start mucking around with pathogens really easily using CRISPR. Really, really nervous about that when you see people going, hey, look at this highly toxic strain we've been able to create in three weeks in the lab. That seems to me the sort of thing where we need a lot more think now, act later rather than the other way around. 
Gotcha. There, well, there even was something that came out recently that Boston University has created a new strain of COVID. I don't know if you saw that. Oh. And the and, and I, I think the mortality rate on that strain in mice is like 80%. Like, yeah. it, it's the most insane thing. I don't understand why we do it. And also, it gives so much fuel to the to, to, to the people totally. that are that totally. are that are saying this was, you know, I think they have the origin much, of it, etc. Stronger justifications and pre-experimental regulation before we right. let people be doing that, rather than going, "Oh, I've done that. Was that a good idea? I don't know. Maybe right. it wasn't the best. Idea. Yeah, that that's that's not helpful in the current situation. No. Like, fine, give meth to, to mice. Stop messing with viruses. Absolutely. Like, yeah. have They're... we not learned anything? Like, exactly. Uh, exactly. Well, I think we know the answer to that. We yeah, really haven't. No, <laughs> we probably haven't. <laughs> right. Well, Nessa, thanks again. It's uh, lovely seeing you again and uh, always a pleasure to chat with you. You too, Michael. It's been lovely. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. So thanks for listening to No More, No Less. I appreciate the time you spent with me today. So please subscribe and rate the show if you enjoyed it. It'll help me create more amazing content and get that next little bit of validation that I so deeply crave. If you didn't enjoy it, well, that sucks. But to make sure... I think you should listen to my next 10 episodes and then decide. I mean, come on. Rome was not built in a day. I'm just getting warmed up here, guys. So thanks again. See you next time.